Okay. Yeah. So um, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for your patience and for joining us today for our twenty fourth lecture, uh, the twenty fourth lecture in the Swaz World Philosophies Lecture Series, uh, where we draw from the rich traditions, uh, philosophical traditions of the world. Uh, and uh, if you were here last month, we had um, a talk on Islamic philosophy, and so it's very nice to have one on on African philosophy today. And we have uh, with us um, a very special guest, uh, Professor Moussa Maimolefe, who is a dear friend and colleague. Uh, we've been uh, involved in several research projects in the last uh, for quite a number of years now. Um, I do admire his work a lot in promoting sub-Saharan African philosophical thought. Uh, today, uh, Prof will be speaking to us on the theme, uh, Human Dignity in African Thought. Uh, but before he, um, he does so, I know many of you are already familiar with who he is. Uh, I will just speak briefly uh, to introduce him. Uh, he's an associate professor at the University of South Africa, uh, the Graduate School of Business Leadership. Uh, he's also the discipline leader of ethics and governance, and he is also the chair of the department Intra-Africa Trade uh, and Investment. Is director of the Center for African Phenomenology and, of course, the editor of um, one of um, our most uh, prized African philosophical journal, the South African Journal of, uh, of Philosophy. He is author of uh, tens of books and uh, numerous articles. Uh, some of his books include um, uh, the most recent one, Anglo-American Philosophy of Religion, um, and others, Ubuntu Ethics, African Ethics and Death, uh, human dignity in an African context, and, and so many others. So, uh, my brother, it's a delight to have you, and we're glad you could connect. And uh, you have the floor. Um, please, uh, for all our guests, please um, remain muted. And when uh, Prof is done with his talk, we'll have time for some conversations, right? Okay. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. I'll, I'll just a quick one. How much time do I have so that I can um, properly? Really, anything between forty-five minutes and an hour at the at, at the max, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, good 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 afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be taking you through uh the, the topic human dignity in African thought, uh, and the way I've structured. This conversation is to start reflecting on the two major concepts of this particular discussion. What, what we mean by African thought and what we mean by, Af by, by human dignity in African thought. <clears throat> so we're going to start by reflecting on, on those two central concepts so that we create an intellectual uh, context for our discussion. And secondly, we're going to look into the concept itself of human dignity. Uh, what is what is what is what does the concept human dignity denote, and and um, and why is this concept important in ethics and uh, also in political thought? Um, and then we're going to look into leading theories of human dignity in African thought. Uh, we're going to identify. Um, two leading approaches to discuss the idea of uh, human dignity. The first approach, which is dominant in the literature, both in the global north and in the global south, is the uh, idea that dignity is a function of some capacity of our nature, uh, which sometimes I descri we describe it as a patient-centered, patient-centered theories of value. On the other hand, uh, you find what you call performance theories of human dignity or what I sometimes describe in my work as agent-centered theories of human dignity. These theories tend to be uh, dominant um, in the communitarian uh, cultures or intellectual uh, traditions. Then what I'm going to do also is to give us reasons to doubt these theories, or at least to appreciate ways in which they're inadequate. And then uh, finally, I'm going to suggest a synthesis that one way of marrying the capacity-based theories and performance-based theories could actually offer 
a plausible way or a promising way to capture human dignity. Those are the five things that I want to do in this particular lecture. Uh, I hope I'll be able to achieve that. So let's start with the two concepts that are central in this particular discourse. The concept that throws itself at us is the idea of Africa, the idea of Africa. So when I use the idea of Africa, specifically I refer to a, I refer to a location, a place in a map uh, that when we want to describe, we can think of as a geography. Uh, that, that's what I mean by Africa. I mean a place in a map. I refer to this continent that I'm currently offering this particular lecture on. Uh, so that's the first denotation of this idea, Africa. But the important thing about emphasizing the concept of a place is that place, distinctive feature of a place is that places are occupied, places are concrete. And one of the defining features of places is that they have, set, at least the way I use the term, have got certain cultural features. And some of, some of those features may be symbolical, some of those features may be physical, but the kinds of features that would be important for us to be able to explore the kind of engagement I want us to have this afternoon, we're going to look into what I describe as the intellectual and exological features of a culture. In other words, we are going to look into what thinkers in this particular uh, place called Africa, we're going to look into also intellect, indigenous knowledge and indigenous concepts um, uh, and look also into the value systems. That's what, that's what I mean by axiological features. Uh, so places are characterized by those kinds of things. And it's important for us to associate the place Africa with that uh, because this Africa is a place where we can have a rich harvest of intellectual ideas, uh, intellectual narratives, or even theories that we can use to have meaningful conversations about uh, our presence in the world and also to contribute to other human beings from other places. But also when I use the idea Africa, I don't want to use it in ways that are romantic, in ways that essentialize it. At any given time when I use the word Africa, I appreciate that there could be things that we share in common and there are certain assumptions we could share in common, there are certain intuitions we could share in common, but that does not suggest that the terrain itself, the geography itself, is not characterized by contestations. And one of the places where these contestations manifest itself is even the name Africa itself can be contested as a proper label to describe the place Africa. <clears throat> but for purposes of our discussion, we're going to think of Africa in those two terms as a place, and we think of this place as culturally suffused. And some of this uh, cultural suffusement is characterized by intellectual and exological ex features. And one such exological feature is just this idea of Ubuntu, that it gives you an indigenous uh, moral concept through which to make sense of the world. Um, so that's when I use by the term Africa. What do we mean then by African thought, simply put? By African thought, African thought, I think of a of an intersection of, 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 of human experience and human agency in a particular place that becomes very productive. And some of that productivity results in creativity. Some of it results in concepts that are useful to frame the world. So we're going to think uh, of African thought as, as a rich, as a geography that is rich in many things. But one of those things that is rich with are intellectual indigenous uh, concepts through which we can make sense of the world. And one such resource is what we might describe as African philosophy, a philosophy that can be associated with a specific geography. And, and we'll be able from this particular geography that is rich in, in concepts and theories and intuitions, uh, we can be able to imagine value theory or specifically for our purposes, uh, human dignity. Another question that we might want to ask is the second is the second concept that's important. Why human dignity in African thought? And I think the answer is to be found in what I describe as a double tragedy. Uh, the double tragedy defines expression in two ways. That on the one hand, Af Africa was denied the status of a place. Right? When, when, when global north uh, observers uh, related with Africa historically and even, cont even in our times, there's a tendency to look at Africa and not see a place, but see a space, see it as empty and, and, and relate to it as if it is empty. Um, one famous uh, Western thinker, when writing the history of the world, he made this particular observation about, uh, 
Africa. This is uh, Hegel. At this point, he's writing about history of the world and he makes this point. At this point, we leave Africa, not to mention again, for it is no historical part of the world. It has no movement or development to exhibit. Uh, there are no historical movements in it. All right, so Africa is considered as empty. It has no culture. It has no history. It has no narratives. It has no heroes. It has no intellectuals. It has nothing to contribute to human history. Hence, he says, there's really nothing much to say about Africa. So uh, there's the tendency that, that this is the kind of tendency that sponsored the project like colonization, slavery, racism, and so on. The, the tendency to look at Africa not as a place, not as a place, but as a space that is empty, that is waiting for external intervention, as you see in the forms of colonization. So, <clears throat> so why human dignity in African thought is to correct that tendency of think Africa is a space. It's to say Africa is occupied by people. And if Africa is occupied by people, one of the most important things that we need to think about is people who occupy the space and who want to make a contribution to the world that, hey, um, we can't be denied the status of a place. Can't be denied the status of a place. All right. So that's just one reason why we think about Africa from African thought is to create a voice for Africa in this particular context. The second tragedy was not only the denial of a place, but even people in the place were denied the human status, were denied the human status. The denial took different forms if you read the literature from uh, from different scholars from the from the Western archive, be it anthropologists, be it philosophers or scient scientists, the one form of it that it took could take the form of infantilization. So this is a kind of inferiorization or degradation that regards adults as children. In fact, the whole continent would be described as a child, as an infant. And if it's a child, then it requires a paternal figure that is going to come and intervene and help in the nurturing of the, of, of, of the continent. And this is what uh, uh, sponsored the, the civilizational project. Uh, so there was a tendency to think of, of Africans um, and to think of them as, children, as perpetual children that requires uh, the tutelage of, 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 of uh, their white brothers and uh, white brothers in the, uh, at, at, at large. Um, and that is why you see also one of the features of apartheid was that the black uh, black adults would be called boy yeah, in the in 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 the Africa Af Af African uh, culture, you know the the the, the master would be called bass and and the servant would be called a boy. Uh, it would be called a boy. That's a kind of infantilization where one is refuses the status of another as a human being by perpetually subjecting them to a status of a child. Another form that this kind of uh, denial of human status took was what we call animalization. Animalization is a kind of inferiorization where you associate or you reduce a human being to an animal status to an animal status. And if a human being is an animal, then a human being has no culture, then a human being has got no economy, then a human being has got no history, a human being has got no stories. And as a result, they've got no use for land, they've got no use for the economy, and therefore they've got no intellectuals. And therefore, there's not even a place to discuss things like human dignity, because that kind of value does not even emerge about them. All right. The last form that this took is the form of objectification. And objectification really is what sponsors things like slavery, where a human being is reduced to, a, to an object or a thing. And because you're a thing, you can be used as an instrument. So one of the facets of slavery is when a human being is reduced to a human instrument, where all your life is dedicated to you saving the interests of the master by working in the field. You've, even when they want a child out of you, you just become an instrument for making a child. If they want to torture you, you just become an instrument to be tortured because you're not regarded as a being. You are regarded as a thing. So all of these are different forms of inferiorizing human beings with the purpose of trying to dehumanize them. At the, at, the, at the core, at the core of the troubled, at the core of this inferiorization, is dehumanization. And I and this dehumanization is not just picking out that one individual or that. It's a group thing, it's systematic, where there's a denial and erasure of the human status. And when I say it's a systematic, it's systematic I mean the systems put in place. Right? Uh, there's an apparatus put in place. Right? That number one, it psychologically socializes you to believe that you are not human, but it goes a step further. It creates conditions that makes you to be less human. 
Uh, so when you see colonization, when you see slavery at play, what's happening there, it's something very systematic. It's a system that affects both the, the oppressor and the oppressed uh, to, to actually come to believe that uh, another human being is not a human being and does not have dignity. So that's the tragedy that allow that that forces us to talk of human dignity in African thought because we were denied a status of a place. But on the other hand, we're denied a status of a human being. It is this double denial of place of place and uh, human dignity that really sponsors uh, us to have this discussion about human dignity. Right. In other words, it's us saying, uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> in fact, the aim uh, of this particular is to affirm Africa truly as a place. And if it is a place, then it has narratives, then it has ideas, uh, uh, then it has got intuitions, then it has, has it has got cultures from which we can learn from. Right. Moreover, not only does it recognize place, but it also affirms the humanity of black bodied human beings. Black bodied human beings are truly human. <coughs> but this talk affirms Africa as a place and also affirms uh, the humanity of African people, or what I call black bodied human beings, um, by inserting their voice. At least in this instance, I'm the one who's inserting their voice and perspective on this important issue of human dignity. I, it's in a conversation that is dominated by voices from the global north. Uh, extensive literature that talks on human dignity from the global north. Uh, this particular talk sponsors a conversation from the global south, specifically from Africa, to say that there are perspectives that can be drawn from black-bodied human beings and black-bodied intellectuals and black-bodied uh, from cultures of black-bodied human beings to reflect on this question of human dignity. Uh, so, so the aim really is to affirm place and uh, by discussing this idea of human dignity. <clears throat> and now that we clear about what the aims are, what this talk is about, and the motivations behind this talk, we may now venture into the concept of this particular dis discussion, this thing called human dignity. What is human dignity? The idea of human dignity associates human beings with moral worth. In other words, this idea understands human beings just by being humans, just by being human as bearers of moral worth. And when you think about this idea of moral worth, um, the idea that emerges is that you think of human beings as morally special or morally precious. Just this idea that being human makes you special in, in, in a morally relevant sense. Now, I use the word moral worth to capture the idea of human dignity. And to appreciate uh, this idea of moral worth, I, I invite us to distinguish two ways of viewing and uh, of, of viewing and valuing human beings, right? Or human transactions. On the one hand, you can talk about price. Uh, when you talk of price, you're talking about a particular way of viewing and valuing something. And also we'll talk of worth as well. Talk about a way of viewing and valuing something. The difference between these two ways of imagining value and value, viewing and, and, and the idea of value is that price uh, denotes the kind of value that depends on external factors. And, and, and this kind of dignity, this kind of way of talk of value, you can think of it as this extrinsic, extrinsic to, right, to emphasize that the value at play is dependent on factors that are outside of the object that's associated with value. And one perfect example of this kind of value is money. If, if you take money itself, let's say you're holding a $20, $20 bill, you're holding a $20 bill, the value of money is not in the paper itself. The value of money in part depends in the market, but particular markets uh, would value money differently. In some countries, uh, the, the, the value of money will be protected by some precious mineral. In one case, it could be a gold. In some countries, the value of money could be uh, the oil, right? Uh, depending on the market value or, or that is placed on the, on the gold, 
money, the, the status of money will depend on that. Now, the money itself as it is, it's got no value. Its value depends on the market. In that sense, the value of money is, in, is, is extrinsic. It's outside of it. I, on the other hand, there's a kind of value that we describe as worth. The value that we describe of worth imagines a value that is internal, depends on internal factors. In other words, it's in, it, the idea of intrinsic value. <laughs> the idea of intrinsic is important, and I'll, I'll, I'll discuss this. The, the location of the value of the thing is inherent in the thing itself. That its value does not depend on anything external of itself. The value of this thing is in its is this in this thing itself. And one example of this, which might be controversial, is when you see something beautiful, right? I I know this idea that beauty depends on the beholder, right? Um, but if you look at a beautiful sunset, of beautiful art, I, I if if truly that thing is beautiful, I, the beauty of that thing. Is in it is in the thing itself that is beautiful, right? It's in it, right? Uh, some 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 things about it, uh, uh, some constitution of it uh, captures right, the value that the value is intrinsic to the thing itself, right? So so we draw a distinction between values that are, are, and depend on internal and external factors. We tend to locate human dignity on the value that depends on internal factors. Right? So in this sense, we can think of human dignity as a kind of value that we are born with. It's intrinsic. Right? It, it is a function of the kind of a thing that we are as human beings. In other words, we are ontological kinds. Right? In other words, we're not a tree. We are, we are not a mountain. We're not a river. We're a specific kind of a thing. And because of the kind of a thing that we are, we have value that that depends on this kind of a thing we are. So when we talk of human dignity, we are referring to the value that resides in the kind of a thing that we are. Right? You know, just, just by being human, you have value. That, that, that's what this idea symbolizes. To further clarify this idea, we can use the analogies of location and height to concept conceptualize human dignity. So when you say you have human dignity uh, and, and we refer to intrinsic value, we are emphasizing the view that this value is located in the nature of the thing itself. In other words, just by being human, you've got this dignity. In other words, just to present in the world as a human being, just that presence enough is indicative of value. And this value has to do precisely with the kind of a thing that you are. All right. So that's the idea of intrinsic value, that the location, is, the location of this value is just in the fact of being human. <laughs> Excuse me. But also we can use the analogy of height. When we use the idea of knowledge of height, we don't use the idea of intrinsic value, which identifies the source or the location of value. We use the idea of superlative value. The idea of superlative value indicate, indicates, indicates height. In this sense, it indicates that you've got, if you think you've got the highest value. In other words, if there's a hierarchy in which we can put things in terms of value, uh, the idea of human dignity says human beings occupies the highest standard. Uh, in the literature on human dignity, this height that's associated with human dignity is usually uh, associated with the rank of nobility or the rank of royalty. Right? So the rank of royalty tends to be a rank that draws a distinction between commoners and royalty, and royalty is thought to be high. So when we, we say you have got human dignity and we talk of this idea of superlative value, we mean in the natural world, human beings, compared to any other thing, be it a, a grain of, 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 of sand, uh, be it a mountain, uh, be it an animal, human beings occupy the highest level. Even if these things might have value, but in the order of priority, human beings have got the highest value. So when you say human being captures the idea of moral worth, we're saying on the one hand, human beings have got this worth in and of themselves. And compared to other things that may or may not have value, the value associated with human beings is the highest kind of value. So that's how we use the idea of human dignity. <laughs> All right. So, and the profound idea about this idea of human dignity, just by presenting yourself as a human being, you are being that you are a pest, you are a kind of a thing that has got both intrinsic and superlative value. Your value in and of yourself 
and compared to other things, you've got the highest value. And the implication of this is this. If you have to make a choice between driving over a human being and a cat, uh, the idea of human dignity says, yes, even if a cat has value, the value of a cat is less than of a human being. Uh, a cat has value but does not have dignity. So drive over a cat. Uh, that's the intuition behind the idea of intrinsic and superlative value. It, in the natural space, human, in the natural uh, community, human beings have got the highest value. Right. So, so now that we've, we've captured that the idea of human dignity indicates a being of value or being that is morally precious, why is this idea important in ethics and in politics? And I suggest three reasons. I suggest three reasons. The first reason is the idea what the idea of human dignity gives us a basis to protect human beings. Right. And by that I mean, when something is precious and something is morally precious and special, certain ways of relating with it are wrong, right? But not only certain ways are wrong, but they wrong it, that is, they harm it, right? And therefore the idea of human dignity imposes a duty both on individuals as agents, as citizens, and on the state to protect human beings from unnecessary interferences and harms. And some of those harms could include things like kidnapping. Right? Kidnapping is wrong. Uh, because it undermines the value of a human being. That's why a human being must be protected from such treatment. Torture, rape, murder, and all kinds of, of things that we think, and these things are wrong precisely because they don't treat a human being as a being of value. Right. This idea is also called in the literature the idea of agent-centered restrictions or the idea of constraints. I prefer the word protection, that the dignity is the concept that offers protection. Right. It says certain ways of treating human beings are wrong. They're so off the mark. Why? Because they fail to recognize their status. Fail to recognize their status. So that's one, 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 why this idea is important. I know that this idea is important because it tells, it, it tells us how states must be organized. States must be organized around protecting human beings, uh, protecting human beings. Uh, uh, um, so, yeah, at, at a macro level, even at a micro level, it tells individuals the way they relate with each other, they should protect the value of a human being. The second why this idea is important. It offers us ground. It explains why we should assist or empower human beings, right? In other words, human, if human beings, beings are special, it means there are certain things that they can do and they're capable of, but they need assistance. They need empowerment to be able to achieve those things, right? And this empowerment could take different forms. If you are subjected to poverty, the state has a duty to assist you to take out of poverty so that you can live a truly dignified life. If if it's important for you to be able to have literacy, for you to be able to navigate life and to live a meaningful life, the state has a duty to provide education so that you can live a, a, a proper human life, right? So the idea of human dignity explains to us why we need things like public health, right? Uh, disease can be disempowering, disease can be paralyzing, right? So the state has a duty to provide public health, that kind of empowerment so that you can live a, a dignified life, right? Unemployment can be disempowering, right? The state has got a duty to create conditions that are conducive for, for the market to be able to create jobs and for individuals to be able to create jobs and for the individual to be able to pursue a gainful life so they can pursue their dreams and make something out of themselves. So the empowerment aspect of human dignity, it also explains why um, uh, uh, we should be able to treat human beings in a particular way, particularly if they've got lack or incapacities. <coughs> and the last aspect of human dignity, that human dignity does something very powerful in political thought. It explains why we are equal. And when we talk of equal opportunity, when we talk of um, um, uh, when we talk of um, uh, 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 creating opportunities for women, creating opportunities for children, uh, uh, treating different heterosexual uh, groups equally, the explanation is simple. Why must we treat people equally? Because all of them have got human dignity, and no one has got more dignity than another. The idea of human dignity is equalizing in its nature. It explains to us why we are equal. The president, the king, and the poor man under a bridge in Soweto, all of them are equal because all of them have got human dignity. So this idea is powerful in ethics and in politics because it explains why we should be protected. The value we have explains why we should be protected 
protected. Uh, uh, it explains why uh, all things being equal, we should be empowered or we should be assisted. And also explains why we are equal and we should be treated equally. And we should build societies of equal citizens because we are beings of equal value. <coughs> so, so that when a person says, uh, I'm also human, it's an expression of something very deep. I'm a being of dignity. I desire also to be protected. I desire also to be empowered. And I desire also to be treated with equality. That's why this idea is important of human dignity. And this importance, you see it in the jurisprudential order, particularly if you see it in the United Nations. The United Nations talks of human rights, but the United Nations then tries, Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, tries to associate this idea of human dignity with human rights. Right? And one interpretation is that human rights function precisely to protect human dignity. Right? And that's why then all of these uh, regimes of rights to protect this human dignity. If you look into uh, constitutions of countries from Germany to South Africa and many other countries, human dignity seems to be the concept that explains uh, uh, why the state has got a duty to empower its citizens, why freedom is important, why equality is important, why access to opportunities and welfare is important because of this, of this idea of human dignity. That's why this idea is very important also in jurisprudence, in explaining uh, the ordering of society. It's one of the reasons that we need to protect human dignity. So that's why this idea is important. So, so far, so far, we, we've covered two things. We, we've explained the purpose of this, the idea and now we've just and we've explained this idea of human dignity and now we've explained why it's important and now <coughs> we we tend to african theories of human dignity so all along i've just been giving you a context to understand um to, to understand um uh, the the importance of this idea of human dignity now we are moving to 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 theories of human dignity, uh, so that we we think about how how do African people or the literature in African thought conceptualize this idea? In other words, how do they explain what makes us special or more precious? So it's one thing to say uh, someone has got human dignity, another thing to explain why they have human dignity. So the function of theories is to give us an, an account, an explanation of why we think we have dignity. Um, so there are two two broad accounts. Uh, two broad accounts. The one account we we, we we classify them as, if we have to create a taxonomy, uh, we divide them into two. The one set of accounts we describe them as capacity-based theories of human dignity. Uh, the other kind of another approach is called the performance-based uh, theories of human dignity. You can even describe them as merit-based theories of human dignity. Um, I will explain why I prefer performance over merit. Uh, so capacity-based theories of human dignity. Um, and this is a whole swath of literature that tries to explain human dignity. And this is an influential view in African thought. If you look into influential theories, uh, there are two particularly influential theories, radical communitarianism and um, moderate communitarianism. And there's contemporary interpretations of Ubuntu that try to account for human dignity. All of them, they try to account for human dignity by identifying a feature of our nature which they think makes us special. So some theories take a religious interpretation. They think we are special because we possess a particularly special spirit. Uh, the Akans would call that spirit um, uh, ak okra. They call it okra, the Akans. Uh, the Sutus would refer to that spirit as siriti. Uh, the Nguni people would refer to it, uh, the Zulus in particular, as istunzi. Um, uh, the Kosas would refer to it as isdima. Uh, but one thing that comes out very clear here, they think there's a spiritual energy that is a part of what it means to be human. And this spiritual energy makes us to have this dignity, right? have makes this dignity. Some accounts of it are not so religious. They explain it by some uh, physical feature of our nature. Some people would say, explain it, of course, we can reason. We've got the capacity for rationality. And this sexuality makes us to be autonomous. It makes us to make plans and to live according to those plans. And if you can do that with other things don't have in the world, then you've got dignity. <laughs> the idea of capacity for autonomy. Uh, some people talk of capacity for moral sense. The idea that we can make moral choices. The idea that we can make moral evaluations. The idea that we've got volition. We can choose between things. That's what makes us morally special. 
I, what is common about all of these accounts, they pick some, some feature. Uh, so sometimes I refer to it as an equipment of our nature. I'd be, be it the rationality, be it the soul, uh, be it moral sense, uh, whatever it may be as a basis for moral status. So just having this equipment is what gives you a uh, human dignity. What are the advantages of a capacity-based account of human dignity? Any human being that has the relevant capacity has got human dignity. If the capacity that does the job is, is autonomy or rationality or moral sense, if you have that, then you have, you have, you have human dignity. Right. Um, so in other words, if, 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 if it's just mere possession of this capacity that gives you human dignity, then you don't achieve it. Uh, it's some, you don't earn it. It's something that you're born with. It's just by being this thing that you are with this capacity, then you have dignity. And because of that, you do not lose it. Uh, the only way you could lose it, if you would change your nature dramatically and you wake up one day as an animal or if you die, right? And the, the state and a duty has a duty simply to recognize your human dignity because you're the kind of a thing that you are possessed with a particular capacity. <clears throat> this is the standard account of human dignity that you'll find in the literature. So if you read <clears throat> standard interpretations of Ubuntu, <clears throat> they, they, they tend to account for, for it by appealing to some capacity as a basis for what makes us valuable. <sighs> Two major criticisms, and I think this is very important. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing in terms of time. Uh, uh, two major criticisms of the capacity-based theory. Um, and the, the first criticism really is, it's, 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 I think it's intuitive, uh, that there are certain human beings that don't have certain capacities that are characteristic of human beings. If you take rationality, for example, we have people, you have infants, you have uh, severely mentally impaired uh, persons. Um, um, you have people who 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 are comatose. Um, you have people who are born uh, they are called non Catholics who are born without certain parts of the brains. Um, they don't have uh, the capacity for rationality, right? And the difficulty with this particular challenge is that. Um, it is difficult, and I think this is a, a major concern. There is not a single capacity that you can identify that all human beings have, and all of them have it to the same degree. But the issue of degree, we can put it on the side. It's difficult to find a capacity that all that all human beings have. And if this capacity is had by some human beings, not had by some human beings, it means that human dignity is not universal. Human dignity is a reserve of those who've got that capacity. And the idea of human dignity seems to be this idea that has got this intrusive element to it. It wants everyone to have human dignity. But if human dignity is a function of some capacity, you're going to find some human being who does not have that capacity. And one of the things that's interesting, it does not matter how you frame this capacity. Uh, you're not going to find one capacity that all human beings have. And as a result, you're going to have a struggle. You're going to have a struggle to, to find a capacity. And this has been one of the difficult uh, uh, criticisms of capacity uh, 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 based approach. Another criticism is that the capacities that we tend to identify, they tend to be human capacities. And if their capacities were identified as human capacities, we fail to explain how other things that are not human or who lack these capacities can have value. Many of us tend to think that a cat has value, but a cat may not have rationality, at least not in the way that we describe rationality. And in other words, these theories we describe as they tend to be anthropocentric. This is the case, and I've, I've published on this in the African Thought. So that's one criticism. But for me, what I find to be a blowing criticism that has not been explored in the literature in African Thought is, is what I call the, the criticism, what I call phenomenological distortion caused by the ontological attack on the humanity of black-bodied human beings. So I find something very interesting in the literature. When African thinkers want to write about human dignity, they want to refer to capacity. And I find this to be very strange. Why are they referring to capacity? Because they've got, a, they've got an extensive history, right? In South Africa, that history starts as far as 1652, right? But in other parts, it starts with the colonial projects, right? In the Americas, it starts with the arrival of slavery, where black-bodied human beings who've got that possess the capacity that is thought to give human beings uh, human dignity. But they're denied that dignity. They're denied that dignity. 
<coughs> and this is where my concern seems to come from. We need to say, how can, how can African scholars or scholars of African thought want to limit themselves to accounting for human dignity by appealing to capacity when we've got an extensive history of people with the sad capacities but that deny dignity, right? And, and this for me, I think, requires us to think quite critically and philosophically and, and so that we can be able to see how we can rescue the capacity-based approach, but also how, to, can, how can rescue the literature in African philosophy. And I think one of the things that we need to see that as much as the capacity might do the job, right, we need to think carefully about that. And in my closing remarks, I'm going to reflect on that. But also, we need to realize how, when you have lived in a world of colonization, in a world of apartheid, in a world of, of race, racism, uh, how must you approach political theory? And one of the things that you must realize that people who have lived in those conditions, it will not be enough for you to simply say you've got dignity because you've got the capacity. Why? Because they have suffered what I call phenomenological distortion. Phenomenological distortion, I mean, th their lived experience has been distorted uh, to, to make them believe that they've got no intrinsic dignity. They, may, they have it, but the, phenomenologically they've been distorted. And people like Franz Fanon and people like Steve Biko explain this kind of distortion. Right? To live in a world that functions to perpetually deny the humanity of black-bodied human beings. Right? In other words, there's a condition, there's a world, there's a way in which the world function, and the functioning of this world uh, perpetually sends a message. Right? And this message is systematic, it's, it's amorphous, uh, uh, but the, the, the onslaught is, is unending that continually slays to black-bodied human beings. You, you don't have intrinsic dignity. And this has got the massive implication on how they think of themselves psychologically, and then affects their lived experience uh, to doubt that they've got this dignity, right? So, so this dignity is systematic because it is structured in a particular way, that there's a shape that the world has taken, is continuous. In other words, it, 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 the world is designed to make sure that the denigration happens, the repudiation happens. And, and the result of that is people believing that they've got no intrinsic dignity. All right. So, so in a situation like that, and, and I want to explain this. Uh, uh, so in other words, there's an ontological, there's an ontological um, uh, condition of the world, right? And and this ontological condition of the world results in phenomenological distortion, right? Now, it affects how you think of yourself as a, as a being of value, as a being of value. <clears throat> and in other, words, in other words, to do proper political theory, we must understand the ontological makeup of the world, right? Um, and one of the ways to understand ontological is to look into one of the sons of the soil, soil from the Eastern Cape uh, in Ginsberg, uh, uh, Steve Biko, uh, and also another person to look at is uh, Vincent Lloyd, who writes on Black philosophy. He says, living in a world bent on the destruction of Black life, right? That the world is structured in that it is committed in destroying Black life, right? So if you see slavery, right, its manifestation, its manifestation in, in the U.S. is in the form of police brutality, is in the form of lives that you see in, 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 in the ghettos, in the lives that you see in the favelas in Brazil, the life that you see in the township, the inequality, the brutality, uh, the high levels of crime. It's the world structured uh, to deny uh, uh, dignity and, and to destroy black life, right? Uh, and it makes a very profound point in the context of think of slavery. This is Vincent Lloyd. He says, persuading a person that another person can be treated as a slave requires an enormous apparatus. Enormous. So there must be a system in place. And this system operates at a level of ideas, how we think and how we process the world. It operates at a level of habits. There are certain habits that we are taught insidiously uh, and some intentionally and some overtly. Right? At a level of feeling, how we feel, the institutions and laws that conspire to make one class of people appear less than human, right? So some of the practices that we see, right, where some people will make other people eat human feces, some people will, will treat people in all sorts of ways. Whenever you think
is just one person who's an aberration, a deviation. No, there are systems at place that shape our, our ideas, our habits, our feelings, our and the institutions, right? Formal and non-formal, that, that create an idea in us that you see another person as an unperson. This cannot simply be an issue of an individual with a terrible psychology. It's deep-seated in systems. <laughs> and another point says we must conceive of the world as comprising of the system of domination that infects the world. It it, it, but it conceals itself, make it appear that there's no domination itself. So this system can even vanish while it is it present in making sure that it, it's creating these inequalities and it's creating conditions that destroy black life. So, so it is these ontological condition, what I describe of the world, right, um, that leads to this phenomenological uh, um, a distortion. When Steve Bigot talks about this uh, in, in, in the book, I write what I say, in all aspects of black-white relationship, both in the past and in the present, we see a constant tendency by whites to dispute an inferior status to what is black. Everything black is conceived as, as, as inferior. Our culture, our history, and in fact, all aspects of the black man's life have been battered nearly out of shape in the great collusion between the indigenous values and the anglo boer So what is happening here, it's still giving us a picture that there's a way that the world is shaped. And one example of this, I go through education at university. My entire education, 8, 95% of it, I am socialized into a white world. I'm socialized into ideas of thinking about the world. No mention of Soweto, no mentions of intellectuals from Soweto, no mention. It, it, it's like Soweto is just by the way. The entire black lived experience has no place in this world for you to be an intellectual, for you to, to, to matter. You, you must be taught about Plato, about Aristotle, about Immanuel Kant. You must be taught about Bernard Williams. But there's no, there's no Michael Stolle, right? There's no Dodana Manzana. So it's, it's not a mistake. It's not a mistake, right? If you look into the higher education institutions, even in Africa, the majority of, of intellectuals that shape us as intellectuals, it's, it's a part of this, it's shaping the inferiority of black thinking and the superiority of the world is structured like that. Right? Who owns businesses in the world, who, who, who the global structure of the world, who has a permanent seat in the United uh, uh, Security Council, who does not have, right? Who, who's got veto power uh, in, in the United Nations, who does not have? Is this structure where black bodied human beings have to go and beg, have to be perpetually, in, it's structured in the world, structured in the world. Who's poor, who's suffering? <coughs> who's got, who, <coughs> excuse me, who's got a right to have nuclear power? South Africa had to, de had to, had to, to, to destroy its nuclear weapons, right? Uh, America is supervising other countries that they, they must not have nuclear weapons, but who should have nuclear weapons and they should not. So all of those things, they tell us that there's a way the world is structured. Right? And the way that the world is structured has got a particular function that can create what I call phenomenological distortion. And the part of this phenomenological distortion, it creates its inferiority where you doubt that you've got this intrinsic value. And this is an insight that escaped a lot of African thinkers when they think of dignity. They think it's enough to say you've got capacity. I'm suggesting that we need to know that as a major criticism this idea. I, I won't get into this, uh, but this uh, common uh, quotation by the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the man of the oppressed. But one way to interpret this is the distortion that has happened, that you don't believe that you've got any value. You don't believe that you've got intrinsic value. And for you to find value, you must perpetually escape blackness so that you mimic whiteness. You want to create whiteness. I mean, one of the things that fascinates me about universities in Africa, the highest standard of what it means to be a proper university is to be like a white, is to be like, oh, Oxford, right? We don't think the standard could be Africa, where we set an agenda for ourselves. I'm very happy. I'm very happy that uh, our university wants to be a premier African university. Because the so, but the point I'm trying to make is not it, the point I'm trying to make is that the world is structured such that black-bodied human beings don't believe that they've got intrinsic dignity, and they always have to look elsewhere for them to have value. So that's a distortion that I think I'm, I'm referring to that I think is a feature of a capacity-based account. And my, my response is that a robust account of human dignity must be able to respond to the ontological condition that create the phenomenological distortion. Uh, so I think things like black consciousness, the aim was to deal with this distortion. The work uh, by Fanon, 
was to deal with this, what I describe as phenomenological distortion, that uh, even if people end up not believing in their value, right? Uh, and, and I think there's a serious critique to the work in African thought. And I critique, I frame it, the clearing weakness of extant accounts of human dignity ignore the ontological condition of anti-Blackness and the consequent inferiority complex that has come to attend the Black-bodied human beings. So something uh, has to be changed in the way we theorize about dignity. Uh, I'm about to finish. Uh, uh, let me just go to the performance-based theories and then I'll I'll conclude just now. Performance-based theories, they don't account for human dignity in terms of the capacity we have. They account for it in terms of, of how we conduct ourselves. So there are two distinct ones. One theory is by Ikunube, another theory is by Vincent Lloyd. The Ikunube theory is what I call the Ubuntu-based theory. The Vincent Lloyd theory is what I call the struggle-based theory of human dignity. <laughs> On Ubuntu, one has dignity if they are able to pursue virtue or achieve virtue. Say, hey, you are a person. That means you, you, are, you have a humane character and you are characterized in your conduct by, by kindness, mercy, magnanimity, magnanimity, love, altruism, friendliness, generosity, uh, tolerance, uh, peace, uh, and so on and so forth, right? right? So in this particular sense, uh, the capacities don't have value. In fact, if, if they have value, it's not intrinsic, it's instrumental. Right? It's what you do with your capacity that gives you dignity. The capacity itself has no dignity. I think there's something wrong with that, right? And then, so in the sense, you achieve dignity, achieve dignity. And when you say you've achieved dignity, you've got a good character, right? The weakness of this particular approach is that it, it overlooks the ontological conditions that create phenomenological distortion. It, it overlooks that. I, so, in other words, I mean, the perfect example here is a South African case. When South Africa was negotiating this transition, there was an emphasis that Af Africans must forgive, uh, Africans mu must, 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 must be kind, they must be tolerant, you know, they must be nice. But there was no discussion of how we're going to change the ontological condition that, that are anti-Black. That discussion was not there. How do we create a world where all human beings can live as equals, where all human beings will have equal access to material gains, where all human beings can develop intellectually? Well, that question was not asked. The ontological conditions exist of anti-blackness. The only thing that was promoted was Ubuntu that does not address the underlying injustices, the underlying ontological condition that uh, oppresses uh, uh, black-bodied human beings. Uh, so it's this kind of approach where we say people must be good while we're not. Uh, I mean, the perfect example, and I write on this, is Marikana, the massacre of the people in Marikana. Uh, after that massacre, after that massacre, we, we, what must happen? What must happen? At that particular moment, uh, the, the labor, the work, mining workers were complaining about indecent salaries that huge human dignity was undermined, right? A lot of things were done, but I think what was supposed to happen was supposed to have a national dialogue. And the dialogue was about when minerals were discovered in South Africa, black bodied human beings were treated as cheap slaves. The value associated with minerals was not thought to, to benefit everyone. How do we change that ontological conditions where the wealth that can empower everyone is limited to few elites and executives? That was a moment of that conversation. We didn't have that conversation. Cheap black labor still continues. Uh, mining still operates on the ontological uh, conditions of oppression. But the deep question about the ontological feature of injustice has not been addressed. It's easy to say, let's reconcile, uh, let's forgive, let's build tombstones for those that were killed. But the ontological condition of uh, capitalist exploitation and oppression was not addressed. Uh, it was not addressed. <coughs> Right. So I think that's the weakness of this particular kind of where they promote virtues that do not address the fundamental ontological injustice. So I think that's one major uh, weakness of uh, performance uh, theories when they don't do that. Uh, the other version, what I call the struggle based theory, is very powerful. It recognizes the world as anti-Black, denies Black humanity. And in this sense, human dignity, human dignity, is not being virtuous. Human dignity is having an attitude and, and conduct that's against the world bent on black destruction. 
So in this sense, dignity is about resisting this kind of a world, resisting this kind of a world. I, the, the aim of this struggle is to ret redress this phenomenological distortion by asserting and affirming the humanity of black-bodied human beings. In other words, this is a, a stance of resistance to say, uh, we cannot live in a world like this. We cannot live in a world like this. We want some of our ideas to feature in education. We want our history of the, to be correct. We, we want to have a correct view of, of, of our heroes. Uh, our religions cannot be completely raised. Uh, uh, we, we don't want to find ourselves without military strength to protect ourselves against the bullies in the world. We, we, we want to be able to, to contribute meaningfully to the world because we are equally human. So it's that kind of a struggle. It's a kind of a struggle. Uh, dignity in this way is a struggle against the world that denies intrinsic dignity. It's, it's that struggle. Uh, the struggle of, of a domestic worker that wants to have a voice even as she works in the house of, 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 of an employer that doesn't want to pay a minimum wage is, is that voice is that is those tears that she expresses in that context uh, it's, it's, it's a voice of people who are exploited by banks powerful institutions with ridiculous interest rates who wants to resist who get into strikes who get into protests uh, it, it's that kind of struggle it takes different forms uh, it takes different forms we, we cannot be prescriptive about it but is that it's an activity is what you do and but what defines normatively this activity the activity of struggle against the world that is banned on destroying humanity in different forms, right? right. And, and dignity is not defined by winning against the, winning against uh, uh, the, the system, right? It entirely, that's the activity of resisting, the friction to say the world cannot be like this, right? right. Uh, it, it, that's where it, it, it's challenging the system that dehumanize, right? Um, and, and it's very important that humanization can take different forms. It can take a form of racism, can take the form of colonization, can take the form of patriarchy, where women have, have to resist the world that tries to shape them into a bend of what men want to see out of them. That resistance is a resistance of, of, of dignity. It can take even the form of capitalism, where, where the economy is structured to benefit the few, Right, and those that work it, uh, they are they're exploited. Right, the resistance in that place as well is where dignity is found. And so, in this view, dignity is found in challenging the ontological makeup of the world that distorts our value by by inferiorizing us. And these people who do little things and great things to send a message to say we have intrinsic value. That's what this particular theory says. <sighs> right. Um. But but maybe let me say this this I'm 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 left I think with two slides uh, I'll be finished in in in, four, in five minutes. Um, there's something powerful about the idea that dignity is intrinsic, because it means that I don't achieve it. But if I live in a world that denies that, it means that that theory cannot be sufficient. That theory cannot be sufficient, right? Um, uh, if I live in a world like that. Right. Um, it is not enough for me to be standing at the corner and say, but no matter what you do, I've got intrinsic dignity. You see the impact this has done to the lives of slaves and life of the poor. And it's not enough for you to sit and say, I have it, right? Because the deontological conditions will continue to humiliate and dehumanize you. So I think the synthesis is powerful because it says on the one hand, on the one hand, we must appreciate that we've got intrinsic dignity, but understand the, the powerful threats against it. But for an account of our dignity to be meaningful, we must also merit to the performance part of dignity, where, uh, where part of what it means to have dignity, but also is to struggle in a world to want to assert, to defend your intrinsic dignity, right? Uh, so the struggle against domination is important. It is an expression of recognition of one's humanity and the humanity of other human beings, right? It, it, it is an expression of self and other respect. Right? And because people are denying my intrinsic dignity because I'm black or because I'm homosexual or for any other reason, right? the, the, the act of struggle it's on the first instance the expression of my intrinsic dignity that is being denied. But moreover, it it is it is an it, it, it's, it's, it's an act of self recognition. But moreover, it's an act of asserting self respect and also the respect of those others who are also denied. Right? It it is also an effort to conscientize the evil of living in the world that has systems that can dehumanize for one reason or another. In other words, it's to it this kind of struggle. It says. 
we must be aware that we live in an evil world, right? That there's something wrong about what's happening uh, in Gaza. There's something wrong about what's happening in gender-based violence. There's something wrong about having so many young people uh, unemployed. It's something wrong to have so many uh, black, uh, able-bodied human beings crossing the sea, escaping Africa. What is wrong? What, what are the conditions here, right? So when you resist, the, the act of resistance is to conscientize yourself and others that there's something wrong to live in a world like this. So struggle is important as a way of affirming this intrinsic dignity and also seeking to, 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 to say to the world, I'm aware, but moreover, I want to change that, right? The act of struggle is the act of affirming one's intrinsic dignity. So I think a plausible way or an approach that is promising is one on the one hand that um, appreciates um, intrinsic dignity and one that also uh, appreciates uh, uh, that dignity is something at the same time that we fight for in a world that denies it. I'm not going to get into this. I, I think I'm going to leave it at here. Um, I can share the slides with others and I think I can open for engagement. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, my brother. It, uh, it was a very um, enthusiastic delivery and, and we really do appreciate that. And uh, your points were clearly made. I, I, I think I, I will uh, steal the privilege and begin with, uh, just um, perhaps to emphasize it a bit more. Um, so if, if I understand it correctly, the um, performer-based approach, particularly, particularly that built on struggle, sort of shifts from the uh, focus on intrinsic uh, to the performative, uh, if I got that right, yeah? Yes. Good. Good. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So um, it's it's opened up for questioning. Um, uh, if you could stop sharing your slides, that would be helpful to um, be able to. Yeah, perfect. So um, please um, raise your digital hand um, and uh, feel free to um, make your comments or ask your questions. Yeah. Yeah, who wants to be the first? If 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 I can continue saying some things, if people are still thinking about what to say. So yeah, yeah, I really I... wanted it. Yeah, actually, I wanted not to just say yes to my question. Actually, uh, maybe explain a bit more this shift from the intrinsic to the performative. You know. Uh, yeah. So for me, I think the first thing that I recognize is just the idea that uh, the tendency has been to focus on the intrinsic and then to say, look, be aware that they are performative interpretation of human dignity but these are usually discussed apart so on the one mm -hmm. hand I, I identify that there's something beautiful about the intrinsic it's something beautiful just by just the fact that to what you are you have value and you must be respected but also there's the reality of the fact that we live in a world where a lot of people don't know that and because of how the world is and, and you marry that to the idea of performance, that it's something you must do to remind yourself of your value but also to remind the world and institution of your value Right, there the, 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 the is that. So, so that at least you kept up both aspects so that you address the ontological mm. condition and, 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 and that. And that for me, I think is important. But I think what I wanted to also say in the closing remarks is that there's this huge uh, problem uh, in terms of um, how to account for intrinsic dignity. I, I noted that there's no capacity that you can identify. And I think the project of identifying capacity is very problematic. Um, so one of the suggestions that I make in my closing remarks, which I don't develop, is I think of dignity as an intrinsically heuristic concept. So the idea of human dignity has got two ways to think of it. You can think of it as an essentially contested notion. I, that, there's no there's no perfect theory to capture it, but also you can think it as rich, also as in, 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 in so far as it's intrinsically heuristic. In other words, in other words, this idea will always have elements that we don't know, and some of them we may never know. Right. Mm -hmm. And what this what this seems to suggest something deep about how we think of human nature. Human nature is not something that we can exhaust in the way you could study an insect to say, I know all the parts of the insect. There's always that part of the unknowable, the mysterious about human being. Right. Um, and this is this operates at the level of the phenomenological. 
a level of the phenomenological where human beings are special and distinctive, not because we know that that feature or that feature about them, but because there are things that we could never know about our human nature. And that for me, I think that's where we should try to locate human dignity. Right. The fact that we respect the idea that there are certain things we could never know. We could know about rationality, we could know about all of that. But there are certain things we could never know about human beings. And I think if we rest human dignity on something like that, it does something powerful to us. Right? We're not going now to be judging each other in terms of rationality. Uh, our civilization is better than yours, and yours seems is lower. Yours has got no science, ours has got science, there's yours in, is inferior. Right? But we move the domain to an area where human beings have got no power. Right? They are knowable about human beings. And because all of us equally, there are certain things we could never know about human beings. I think that gives us a powerful way to respect and, and to appreciate what we may call the sacredness of human beings. That's another move I was going to make to suggest how we could save the, uh, the capacity-based view uh, by introducing this idea of intrinsic uh, concept. Uh, and the idea of struggle as well. The idea of struggle of well, there's something that it says about justice. That justice is a permanent, it justice is a permanent project. When you've overcome, when you've when you've overcome, when you've overcome slavery in America, you still deal with different forms of oppression, right? You deal with the KKK. When you've overcome the KKK, you, you deal with mass incarceration of black bodies for small crimes. So, so, you, you, so when you've overcome that, you deal with police brutality. It's evolution of it's evolution of of struggle. Right? That so it seems that a struggle is something that's permanent. We will perpetually engage one different struggle of another. When you've overcome apartheid, when you overcome colonization, when you overcome apartheid, you deal with new struggles. And so the function of what it means to be human is to continually respond to struggle. You never get to a point where you say ontologically I've overcome, overcome the conditions of the world. Right mm -hmm. now, this changes about what you think about justice. Right where people thought justice like John Rawls. It's about a contract that the people get into a contract uh, and you accept that some people will be uh, will be more equal than others and all of that. Uh, this view of justice says there's something fundamentally wrong with the world and will perpetually have to engage with that wrong form of the world in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something interesting about that view of things of justice. Just takes you outside of the common ways of thinking about justice, whether it's Marxism that says you're going to get to a point where everyone is not working, where everyone is equal, where communism, uh, that's fantasy, that's an utopia, that's an illusion. Right? In every form of society we're going to find ourselves in, there will always be a struggle for dignity. Mm -hmm. Thank you so and much. I can, um, I can ask, I I think, can ask this I, question right now. I can ask this yes. question right now. I think there are a few hands. Come, yeah, okay. Go on, go on, go on with the question before we take has the Has any of us come to a point in their lives where they say, hey, I'm done with struggle? If you are there, please raise your hand. I want to see. <laughs> uh, I think there will be no hands. Um, uh, Mina Danda, it's very nice to see you here. Um, uh, your hand was up first. Please uh, go ahead with your question. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you for that absolutely fascinating talk. Uh, I will later maybe write to you and suggest that this is a talk that should be given to the Association of Philosophy Teachers, which is the, uh, an association of all teachers that teach in schools. And I think the kind of change in perspective that is needed will can come from what you've been sharing today. So that aside, my question to you is, um, there is a particular kind of uh, distortion that comes from uh, treating nature as a resource, which is continuous with treating people as a resource. You mentioned it at some point in your talk, but then in your synthesis, it kind of seems to drop out again. And I, I wonder if this is because of the very deep nature in which the anthropomorphic view of human beings is so deeply embedded in when we talk about dignity that we tend to leave that out. So in all the examples that you gave towards the end uh, of the struggles against racism, xenophobia, etc., patriarchy, capitalism, maybe capitalism can incorporate that. Um, the relationship that human beings intrinsically have 
to the world in which we live, uh, our environment in which we live has to be built into our understanding of human dignity. So uh, as an example, I would say that the, the destruction of olive groves in Gaza is an attack on the people of Gaza. It's not just the felling of trees. It is, a, it is a destroying of a particular kind of life, which is going to make the ability, their ability to live with dignity so much harder. And, and that's why I think that somehow we need to build that back. And I was hoping that within African thought, there would be a resource for that, you know, and maybe the struggle of indigenous peoples capture some of that. And uh, in your talk, I would just really would uh, uh, like you to give us an example of what we might read or who we might read, where, and maybe you, you sort of in your own thought have somewhere else discuss this. So that's my question to you. How can we, how can we break, make a break with the idea of treating nature as just a resource or treating people, which is continuous with treating people as just a resource? We as academics and universities are also treated just as a resource. This to be uh, to be dispensed with when when our uh, we no longer contribute to the industry which ha education has become. Um, yeah, I think I think um, thank you, Mina. I think uh, um, uh, Mutsama, do you want to respond to that first before you take others, or you Wait. want the questions to? Let me, maybe okay. let, let's take all the questions. And questions then first. Okay. Um, we we'll have, um, we'll have Tosin text, you know, and hour. then we'll have Peter. Okay. Uh, Tosin, please. Okay. Thank you so much for the Malaysia for the interesting talk. Um, so, um, so I actually think, so I, I was thinking that uh, if human dignity is intrinsic and um, so it is that intrinsic and inherent. I am I, thinking that no amount of treatment from um, from the other should influence uh, 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 the, the, the presence, availability or the non availability of human dignity. Yeah. So, but so that is that that is how. And the second point is that I, I'm trying to understand. Um, your, your theory of dignity, if I understand it correctly, are you saying that uh, dignity, dignity should be understood as, as a non ideal theory in such a way that uh, we can capture it as, as resistance? So at every point in time that uh, you resist uh, a, a kind of uh, an unjust or an undignified action towards your person, you are a nasty or you are you, you, are, you, are, you are showing your dignity. So, so it looks to me like uh, there's no, it's not kind of an ideal form, it's not an ideal form, and then at every point, the situation will around how you respond to it, and in that process, what you are doing here is uh, how we can define human dignity. I just want to be sure if that is what I'm saying. That is the second I point. Did, then the last point. I didn't okay. quite get the second point. If you can summarize it. Okay, so the second point I was trying to say, I'm, I'm saying that, so it looks to me like, in, in talking about human dignity, there is no uh, ideal way of looking at it. It's just a, a non-ideal way that shows that at every situation uh, where, your, where, where, where my dignity is questioned, for instance, I should resist it. So in my resistance, um, I'm, I'm showing my dignity. So it means that what will make me to show my dignity tomorrow might be different from the situation that, that confronts me today. So I'm trying to say, is that form of resistance and um, that, 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 that the situation determines is how you are trying to conceive human dignity. So, so if that is clear, so, so the last point is that I want to talk about prison experience and the, the, the nature of human dignity in, in, in this idea of prison, going to prison, and um, how do we conceive, how do we look at the dignity of prisoners? Uh, uh, is that dignity lost? Uh, and stuff like that, yes, thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Adiete. Yeah, difficult questions. I think we have one more one more question from uh, Peter. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Mulefi, for the talk. It was um, quite interesting. Uh, apologies, I joined late. 
I, I, I just couldn't um, get the time right. Um, so I have to one a question. Uh, well, they are both kind of question, but one comes first with a comment. So the first one is um, the last comment about human dignity uh, to be identified. I mean, the intrinsic approach to human dignity, the capacity approach to be to human dignity uh, to be identified in that place of mystery, in that place where where uh, we cannot just completely comprehend the human person uh, seems a little bit uh, worrisome for me. Uh, that's because I'm wondering why why you would take that route, you know, to say human dignity uh, is 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 should be seen at that place where uh, the human person becomes uh, completely incomprehensible, and then you now talk about that point, that capacity for struggle. So my question here is, would you not rather have us see human dignity in that human capacity to not give up, to continue to struggle, to continue to respond you know, in a dynamic way to different challenges that he encounters in his journey of life, rather than place human dignity uh, at that point where we can't totally understand it, you know, like a mystery. I know that reality is there. We can't completely comprehend the human dignity, but I'm just thinking that um, it perhaps it will give us some cognitive satisfaction and uh, capacity to completely comprehend human dignity or comprehend human dignity. If we say that human dignity in terms of a capacity approach is that um, um, human striving, that capacity of the human person to respond to different challenges, different life challenges, different epochal challenges rather than the mystery. Then the second question I wanted to, I also want to ask has to do with um, uh, this, you know, you raised some or some issues about uh, treatment of humans, you know, black and all that. I just wanted to ask whether uh, in some of the claims you made, you know, about treatment of people of color, treatment of uh, women, uh, of, um, you know, the LGBT uh, group and all that, whether these treatments as, for instance, in the case of white treatment of black, I mean, permits me to use those color terms. I do not really like them, but let me use them here. In the treatment of whites, you know, as whites, are those treatments as a result of white as white, or their treatments or their acts of humans as humans, right? Are they acts of whites as whites, or acts of humans as humans? irrespective of, you know, whatever color we assign as such persons. Uh, thank you once again for your talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, three questions. Let me start with uh, Peter. Um, I think you'll understand my, my temptation to run away from, from an identified capacity. And there's nothing profound about that. I think it's intuitive. Is that I can tell uh, there are a lot of human beings who do not have the capacity not to give up. There are a lot of people that are dejected, <laughs> who have given up, have given themselves over to drugs, and some people commit suicide. So if human dignity is something that is to be universal, I think the rhythm of the incomprehensible, the rhythm of mystery, is much more universal than the, the realm of uh, human dignity. What you call the human capacity to struggle is captured, I think, in this thing of struggle uh, that I talk about. But there I'm not emphasizing so much the capacity. I'm actually emphasizing the actual struggle as where dignity is. And, and notice in this sense as well, not everyone is going to have dignity in terms of struggle. Not everyone is going to have dignity in terms of struggle. Everyone has got dignity in terms of intrinsic uh, dignity, but because of the indignity in which they live in that denies their dignity, it activates the importance of street dignity as struggle. But not everyone is going to achieve that as well. 
So I think my concern with the human capacity is a concern I have about rationality, is a concern I have about capabilities, a capacity for friendliness, is that not all human beings have it. And where's the capacity uh, to, to give, not to give up uh, in different epochs, you're going to find a lot of give uppers in life. And you, can't, you don't want to say they don't have dignity. But the rhythm of the, of the incompetent side seems to me to have the kind of universality that I think makes dignity attractive. And I think that's what underlies the universal declaration of human rights. Um, so that's my response to that. Well, um, whites as white, um, humans as humans. Another, another dimension that I think is coming out in my talk is the phenomenological. Philosophers tend to be trapped at the conceptual level of things, how we think about ideas. But one of the things that I'm emphasizing is the phenomenological. I can tell you now, um, I had friends who come from Nigeria, and this guy says to me, all my life, I, I was never aware that I'm black. But when they entered into a particular ontological shaping of the world, in that world, they had an experience of being black. They started thinking of themselves as black. Uh, these concepts were there, but they meant nothing of being black and white. They meant nothing to them. They were just concepts in the books and all of that. But you enter into South Africa that has got a long history of colonization and a special type of colonization where the world is baked in, where race, where race and racialization is important. Immediately, you experience phenomenologically, you start understanding yourself as black, right? And the particular registers that that you, you became associated with, that particular gestures, but particular way you're located in the world, right? So, so the idea of phenomenology for me does that job to say, it's one thing to say, it's one thing to talk of concepts like philosophers do, but entering the domain of phenomenology, how we experience the world, it opens another world for us. That, so in other words, you can do this thing as a human to human, right? But phenomenologically, phenomenologically, when you've lived in a world where they are black, people in this particular and they're white people right and i can tell you now uh, in south africa you can tell oh this is a white community and this is a black community and there might be black people staying there uh, in that community um I almost never see a white uh, person staying in a black community but the world is structured like that you can't deny that right if you see police brutality in the u.s most likely it's going to be meted to a person with a particular identity right it's ontological framing of this world right so that the, when somebody says black life matters it makes sense in that ontological framing of the world a world that has been racialized for such a long time so <clears throat> so if we want to be uh if we want to, we can say it's human to human uh, uh, um, uh, uh, relations. But if we want to be true to the ontological making of an anti black world, uh, we have to at some point to say, hey, um, it's, 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 it's these constructions of this world that I play here. So for me, I think um, uh, trying to quickly escape using color to describe the world has got its advantages, but has got serious limitations, has got serious limitations. But I think it, that's a discussion that we can have for another day, but thanks for that. Um, uh, and then there's a question by uh, Mina. Um, look, I must say thanks for your kind remarks, uh, Mina, but hey, I think you've really challenged me as well, because I won't lie to you, uh, I'm still trying to, I'm still infected by this philosophy of thinking, of thinking of things, thinking of uh, relations with a lot of uh, things in the world as resources. I'm still a victim of that. And one of the worries that I'm having now is that how I'm going to translate this interpretation of human dignity such that it, it escapes that particular way of thinking of relations with the environment and not to see the environment merely as a resource. I won't lie to you, the philosophical framework that I know is operational in my head is still captured in that stubborn anthropocentric framework. But I take this as an important, I take this as an important uh, challenge for me to think about as I develop uh, this particular theory. Uh, there's an interesting framework developed by a guy called Dennis Gowlett. Uh, he talks about ethical development. You know, ethics, you know that the concept of development has been thought much along the lines of engineering. But Davis Gowlett develops what he calls ethical development. And ethical development for him is characterized by three things. What is the human good? And then there's a question of um, what is a good society? And the last question he asks 
is uh, what is what should be our relationship to the environment? What should be our relationship to the environment? And that question for me is a very important question. And I suppose when he was asking that question <coughs> in the context of thinking about development, he was trying to get us out of this way of thinking of the environment merely as a resource, you know, but to think of more productive ways to think about, about the environment. And I won't lie to you, there's a lot of literature I'm reading in African philosophy, but philosophers that have been trained in the Western canon of thinking, I, I won't lie to you. I mean, if, if I read Menkiti, if I read Jeche, if I read Wiredu, I pick up at anthropocentrism, and I've written on this. I, I read some of the contemporary African philosophers who talk about, uh, I talk about uh, my friend Oyowe, I talk about the last maths, uh, but you those that take a secular interpretation, you see that you see that anthropocentrism playing itself out where we have not really thought about imagining this community of existence manifesting itself in different ways, but not merely as a resource, but as different forms of life where, where dignity can be negotiated differently. So I think I take that challenge and I think it's something that I have to think very, very seriously about and I will do. Uh, thanks for that comment. I think it's something that I have to work on. Um, and my brother, a dieta, uh, brother Chos Elder, uh, Dr. Dieta. Uh, I like this, this idea that no, no amount of treatment of a being of intrinsic dignity changes its status. But note as well here that I make a, I make, I make a move from the ontological. So ontologically, you might have intrinsic dignity, but phenomenologically, you may not have that experience of intrinsic dignity. That's the move. That's the move, right? So when someone says Black Lives Matter, I mean, they're not stating an obvious fact, right? It's not obvious that black lives matter. They're saying phenomenologically, we are like things that can be killed, right? That we're like things that can be killed. That's not our experience of the world, right? If you look at, at, at who stands, uh, if you look at public health institution, you look at who has a higher chance of going to prison, who, you see what I mean? If you look into those, in terms of lived experience, um, it cannot it cannot just be that all life is equal. That's not how we've experienced life, right? Not that everyone has got equal opportunities. Phenomenologically, that's not the experience of many people. <clears throat> so the point I'm trying to make is that let's 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 leave. The, so at the conceptual level, where you say, hey, ontologically we've got intrinsic things, that's correct. But phenomenologically, what's what, what's what is the situation? So when you read people like Steve Biko writing on black consciousness, they're tapping into the phenomenological. So there's something wrong in the world that other people are left to feel inferior. So he says, to, when he talks of a big black body, he says it's a shell, an empty shell, you know, stripped of its culture, stripped of its history. So the lived experience of these people, they don't have an experience of intrinsic dignity. And that is where that I think uh, treatment matters because it affects how you think and experience the world, right? In spite of the fact that ontologically you might say you have dignity, but how much does that matter if your lived experience is not that? Right? If talk of women who are being who are being talk of people in Gaza who are being killed, talk of women who are being uh, kidnapped and raped, and you say to them, "Hey, you've got intrinsic dignity," that matters. No amount of dignity treatment, ill treatment will affect you. I mean, that's not quite accurate, right? Phenomenologic, the experience not of intrinsic dignity, right? So that is why even the reforms we imagine must look into what is it about the world that creates such phenomenological distortions that people can feel this way about themselves. And I think that's where we are going to see real reforms and changes. Um, and I, I, the second idea about non-ideal way to look at, at, at dignity, I like that. I really like that. I really like that. And, and this is a negative project. There's a concept of human dignity in a book published in 2010. It's called, um, the neg it's called uh, Humiliation. Um, um, it's called, the, they, they, they advocate what they call the negative approach to dignity. Uh, the negative at the heart of the negative approach to dignity is the idea that the best way to understand human dignity is by is in terms of when is by studying ways in which human beings can be most violated. And this is important because many of us, when we relate to dignity, uh, particularly people who come from oppressed groups, dignity cannot. It's not difficult. It's difficult to understand it positively, and the best way to understand it negatively is understanding it in terms of uh, reducing these forms of violations, like humiliation, like dehumanization, like objectification. Right. So, so instead of thinking of the ideal, instead of thinking of the ideal, this is how it means not to have. This is what it means to have dignity in a positive sense. Think of, think of, 
think of uh, we want to reduce humiliation. We want to, and specifically, when, when you think of unemployment, you, you think of it in terms of humiliation as indignity. We want to reduce those forms. When you think of homelessness, that kind of humiliation, we want to reduce those kinds of things. I think not thinking in terms of the ideal, but think of 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 of, of dignity negatively gives us a better way to re to understand the world that we live in and understand the phenomenology that people experience, phenomenological phenomenological distortion. But more than that, it helps us to deal more directly with the problems in the world. And I think one of the biggest uh, mistakes you see also when you read about human dignity in African philosophy is this attempt to look for this ideal way of thinking of dignity. While we've got hard cases of, of instances when dignity are violated, which are much more easy to explain, right? And say, we want a world where there's less rape. We want a world where there's no unemployment. We want a world where there's no homelessness. We want a world where there's not so much inequality. We want a world where there's no so much wars. We want a world where there's no genocide. All of those are, are negative forms of dignity. And that, I think, will offer us a better way to think of justice. And as we move into the future, there's no genocide. And in my theory, you will find that there will be something else that we will need to address. You'll find that there's something else we need to address. Right? In Africa, just after we dealt with white rule, we need to deal now with black dictators. There was something else to address, and, and so on and so forth. So I think the ideal approach to... To, 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 to political theory sometimes create those problems, right? And the last question is dignity. <laughs> I wrote something that I can see here. I think I it was about uh, prisons, yeah. Uh, oh, the dignity oh of prisoners, I just, I, yeah. I marked a thesis on, I marked a thesis and I almost failed it on the dignity of prisons. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. Look, to be honest with you, I don't know what I, I don't I don't know. I don't to be honest with you, I don't know what to say. But safe to say, safe to say in African cultures, I find something very interesting, and this might tell us a lot about this. In African cultures, and I'm talking experientially, there was something very interesting about this. That when a person was so recalcitrant and delinquent to a point where they cannot participate meaningfully in harmonious with community, they'll be excommunicated from the community. And 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 they'll be treated as an animal to, to, to the point that they're not good for human fellowship. In fact, they're a threat to human fellowship. And, and they would then be as communicated. And I think prisons could be instances of those where we, and they might have a rehabilitative uh, component to them, uh, might have a rehabilitative component to them. So whereas on the one hand, on, whereas on the one hand, it might not be good for your dignity for you to be sent into prison, but if it has got a rehabilitative if uh, uh, affect, it might be a good way for you to be rehabilitated back to human community. But to be honest with you, I have not thought much about this particular uh, idea of prisons. Thanks a lot. Oh, sorry, I, I was muted. Um, thanks so much, uh, Bussam. I think we have one more question, then we can let you go. Uh, Therese, your hand, your hand has been up. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I'm so moved and excited and uh, my body feels alive with what you're saying, Ntate Mulefe. Thank you. Um, I think what, what, what I feel alive about is the authenticity of your engagement with negative dignity. Uh, and I've been struggling with the um, disconnect and contradiction between what people talk about Ubuntu and the um, erasure of that negative dignity, and so I haven't. I, I, I want. I'd like you to help us engage with that contradiction and where does it lie? Because to some extent, it feels that when we talk about Ubuntu, we denying all the suffering that our people are experiencing and have experienced over generations, and are 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 still there's an expectation to 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 reflect that, and um yeah, so there's that. I I just I'm struggling, and I'd love you to respond. Hey, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot. I think that we share the struggle. We really share the struggle. And then for me, the struggle was crystallized. I wrote a paper about Marikana, as I reflected here. And when I think about TLC, that's a kind of struggle that I have as well. 
uh, when I think about some of our government policies, uh, that's a struggle that I have as well. That um, on the one hand, we've got high ideals of what a person in a post-apartheid South Africa or any other society should be able to achieve. But we are not asking ourselves difficult questions about the ontological conditions that must exist for human beings to be able to achieve those ideals. And I think that for me, that's where the disconnect is. Friends of mine have written papers, the, the, the end of Ubuntu, talk about the end of Ubuntu. And a friend of mine, when he writes this paper, uh, Prof. Matolino and Kudingui, they make an example of a taxi driver who out of frustration pulls out a passenger from the taxi. He pushes him to the floor, he kicks him and and then the minister commenting on that incident says, we need to bring back Ubuntu. And then he says, but where, where, where is Ubuntu? Then he questions the way is Ubuntu. And when I looked at that moment, something struck me that there's something fundamentally wrong with how we do philosophy and mass theorization. Much of it is absent what I call, what sociologists call sociological imagination. Right? So when I look at this taxi driver, it's easy to look at him as an individual, but when you locate uh, the, the work of a taxi driver in the broader taxi driver industry, it's an, it's an industry characterized by violence itself. If you look at the matters associated just with that industry, but if you look at that industry itself, it's responsible for taking so many people to work. But ask yourself about the status of the drivers in that work, the survival mentality of a taxi driver in that work. And then you ask, well, they mean to say, where is Ubuntu in this taxi driver? I think the deeper question that we must be asking, which is sociologically informed, have we created conditions of dignity for the taxi industry sociologically, where even the taxi owner, the contract they get into from the, from the time the J Japan, the company from Japan did develop this uh, Toyotas, from the time the banks, offer interest rates for these taxis. And from the time the taxi owner employs this taxi driver, uh, the socialization in the taxi industry. So the minute you are able to have this conversation in a sociological context, then you can't talk of Ubuntu uh, as, as something that an individual must do because you're missing the point. There are sociologic, deep sociological considerations at play. There are processes and forces at play that make even the invocation of Ubuntu meaningless. Right? So I think for me, conversations that are not sociologically grounded, that's where the problem is, because we don't want to deal with the structures that inform and influence people's lives. Right? It's easy for me to say, hey, the student grade 10 are performing badly, but what kinds of homes do they come from? Have they suffered from standard growth from poor diet? It's a sociological question. Where, where do they live? Do they have access to internet? Uh, do, do they live in countries that, uh, places where there are drugs? These are sociological questions that escape. We just want to deal with individuals. So that, that, that picking out of an individual and making it a point of theorization for me, I find it to be very problematic. So, mm -hmm. so that's why when I talk about ontological conditions that create psychological distortion, that's what I'm trying to hit at. That mm -hmm. our theory must be sociologically grounded so that when we address the issue, we deal with the structural issues that affect people's lives. And if, if for example, if you look into the case of the TRC, if you look into the case of the TRC uh, or Marikana, for, the, for example, which executives were held responsible? Which powerful people were held responsible? It was individuals in the TRC. Yeah, hey, you shot this person. Uh, but where did the instruction come from? The system itself, could we hold it accountable? So we, we run away from the sociological. We want to identify individuals and we simplify matters, right? So people's lives are affected by systems, not just by this individual. So police are killed by, in, in America, police brutality is, is, is executed by this particular police. But it's a structure issues of society. It's not that police just randomly go around shooting. There's a system that sponsors this kind of behavior and it has a history. So I think one of the one of the erasures that that's at the play, particularly in African philosophy and African thought, is the erasure of the sociological. And we want to pin down things to individual. That reductivism, I think, is the heart of us not being able to address issues. Amen. Amen. Thank Thanks. you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, to use your own words, uh, my brother, it's 
it's a disconnect between the ontology of Ubuntu and the phenomenology uh, of people's life, um, the lived experiences. We, we cannot theorize without embodying that theorization. Otherwise, we go nowhere, really. Um, so thanks a lot. It's been it's been a real pleasure. Uh, we've really uh, been, uh, been uh, I mean, your, your talk has left so much to think about um, and so much to uh, do going forward uh, as, as um, scholars within the African tradition. So thanks so much for honoring honor, mm -hmm. honor our invitation and for your enthusiasm in delivering your talk. And thank you everyone who could join and, and participate. Uh, we really, really do appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you um, the last Friday of November for, for our next talk. Uh, have a lovely weekend and stay well. Thank you, thank you, thank you uh, everyone. And thank you for having me, uh, Elvis. And sorry for the elite leech. Uh, I hope I made up for it. No, you did, absolutely. <laughs> It was perfect. Thank you, Thank you yeah, so it much. Was, it was. Thank you.